Thank you for having me. Um, contrary to what my badge says, I am from New York and not New Jersey. It's a little bit like the difference between coming from Edmonton and coming from Calgary. <laughs> so I hear. So uh, I would like to tell you where I came from. I was born in Ohio. And as a child, I visited those mounds that you Patrick. saw, that Patrick showed us. And I was very attracted to it. And my mother had, uh, my, I grew up on a farm. My father farmed 150 acres of vegetables. And every one of us children, I was one of six, had to work on the farm. And we had to be in the barn at 7 a.m., ready to wash and sort vegetables and then pack them. I remember as a young child saying to my father when he was yelling at me for not being there at 7. And I said, but Dad, I didn't even get breakfast. And he said, well, then you're going to have to get up earlier. <laughs> I guess he didn't know the guilt card. Um, and so uh, as a young youngster, I learned very early about the importance of growing things and how valuable, how you treat the land is. And I remember as a young woman in high school wondering, where did it go with all the garbage? It's like a big problem. And even then, when I didn't know anything about BFI or how they handle things these days, I was worried about what happened to Mother Earth. Now, my father also had three acres of glass under one continuous roof. So in addition to the outdoor farm, we also had a greenhouse. And you know those long English cucumbers that you can get from Leamington? My father was the Johnny Appleseed of the English cucumber. And he brought the seed to North America taught both Canadians and Americans how to grow it, and then developed the equipment that people used to shrink wrap it. Wow. And my father would have the priest come in every crop and bless the crop. And I was so touched by what Patrick had to say, because these are my roots as well. So how did I land in New York City? Uh, I was married for 25 years. I am the proud mother of four grown sons. And uh, when I first got married, my husband was in show business. And so we went to New York because that's where his job opportunity was. He was a young singer who traveled with Doc Severinsen, the band that played for The Tonight Show. And uh, I found that I really, really liked New York. And uh, over time, we migrated, and my husband ended up working for my father as a grower. And it turns out that my husband was able to hear the plants, and they would tell him what they needed. Wow. So when he walked through the greenhouse, he could tell what nutrients to put in the water. Um, and of course, my family was behind the early hydroponic work that uh, is now pretty prevalent and my brothers have both been in the business, and so I know a lot about growing. And as a young woman, I was uh, uh, selected as the regional winner for a youth leadership contest because they asked me the easiest question in the world. They asked me, how do you grow tomatoes? Well, I knew that inside and out, but what I didn't realize is that they were checking to see if all the other things that I said I did, I mean, it was obvious that I was you know, and band and drum and all that jazz, but what about, did she really work on the farm, you know? And so I have a deep, deep love for the land. And when my youngest son graduated from college, I was living in Wisconsin, <clears throat> where I'd raised my children. And um, my husband and I, after 25 years, were uh, complete. And so the last 10 years of raising our sons was uh, under my watch. And um, I had been teaching the Merkaba work for about 10 years at that point. And I was working part-time doing that. 
and full-time at a uh, corporate career. And so I was, I was wanting to let go of my home because I felt it would free me to do something even bigger. So I asked in meditation where I should live, and I was told that I had earned the right to live anywhere I wanted. And so I asked if I could live in New York, and it was a great yes. And although I have a home in New York, I feel like I'm a citizen of the world because I spend so much time traveling all over and working with people. I have taught over 10,000 people the sacred meditation called the Merkaba. And in the process, uh, I developed a technique on how to connect with the higher self. Now, in the early years of Drumvelo's work, um, he very early on handed off the Merkaba and its teachings to a group of facilitators, and I was in that first group. Uh, he then realized that he didn't want to run an organization or take care of all the details, administrative or otherwise, so he handed it off then within a very short time, a few years, to a couple, uh, Ron Holt and Lisa Royal Holt, who then developed a certification program and a facilitator program. Now, I was grandfathered in, but I chose to take whatever training they gave just as a point of humility and a way to make sure that I knew what the young students, young teachers would know in case there was something there that I had not encountered myself. And because I made a strong commitment to reach millions of people with my work, Spirit has taken care of a great deal of the rest. Um, I will tell you that I was a reluctant uh, channel and a reluctant teacher, and only because I have seen teachers abuse the privilege and power that is accorded to them. So if you like what you learned today, I invite you to join us tomorrow. And if you like what you learned from me, I invite you to practice it and share it with others, with my blessing, and turn on the inner guru instead of honoring or adulating the outer guru, because we're all inner gurus. And my job, I believe, is to help you reclaim that and remember that. So with that in mind, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this work of the higher self. In the early days of learning the Merkaba, how many of you have either practiced the meditation or have learned it somewhere in a class? Can I just get a show of hands? Okay, well, the Merkaba itself is a very powerful tool that you actually activate by remembering, and we teach you certain kinds of geometry. We're not going to do that in this class. Um, but the steps are very precise, and after you learn this precision, it's kind of like riding a bike or driving a car. Once you learn it, it becomes second nature. And in the early days, we were not allowed to turn on all the fields until we had permission from our higher self. But there was no training on how to know for sure that it was your higher self that gave you permission. Now, as dowsers, you have the benefit of a tool that helps you know what you suspect. And how many, as dowsers, know the answer to the question they're posing of their pendulum before their pendulum moves? When I first learned to douse, I was astounded that I could see the movement in my head before my pendulum started to move. And I began to you know, understand all this in a whole new way and I began to look at this. Now, one day after taking this, at the time, the, the course was um, uh, a full week long and nine hour days, nine to nine every day. And um, there were a couple of incidents that, um, 
really got my attention. And one of them is we did a foot washing exercise right away. And we were supposed to partner with someone in the class and then wash their feet. And they gave us, you know, equipment to do that. And talk about a humbling experience. And I had just come out of my marriage. I was very self-conscious. And there were more men in this class than there were women. It was almost 20 people, but there were more men. And so one of the men that I had met at the introductory class approached me and said, would you partner with me? And I had met his wife, and I felt safe. So I said, OK. And he said, do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? And I said, no, I'd like to wash your feet first, because I'm like, let me get this over with, because I'm really nervous. You know, my hands are sweating. We won't need any water, you know. And um, so <clears throat> I'm washing his feet, and I'm so self-conscious, because I'm feeling like I'm touching this man intimately. And, you know, I, I kind of check in, and, and I get told, just go with the flow and pretend that it's like one of your children. Because I would wash my children's hand, feet, you know, and play. We would sit and do like a foot massage and wash like that. And so I did. And I got really into it. And I felt so full of love. And completely forgot that the feet were attached to this guy. <laughs> and when we got all done, um, this man, who's now a good friend of mine, uh, leaned over to the chiropractor next to him and he said, wow, I think I need a cigarette and I don't even smoke. <laughs> so that's what happens when you open your heart. So after the class, we weren't allowed to activate the Merkaba until we had permission from our higher self. And I was the last person in the class who was getting any of the exercises. You know, a lot of them, the guys would get right away, and then they kind of like hover around me. Why wasn't I getting it? <clears throat> and so I became friends with one of the men in the class. And about, I don't know, three weeks, two or three weeks into it, he calls me up and he said, did you get permission from your higher self to activate your Merkaba? And I knew I had. So I said, yeah. And then he put me on the spot. And he said, and did you do it? Because I hadn't. And that's when I realized that I was afraid to trust that guidance. OK? Now, those of you who are beginning dowsers might feel that way even about dowsing. So as I began to work with my higher self, I began to understand that there were many people like me who didn't know for sure what the higher self was, how to connect with it, how to know, and so on. And so since 1994, I've been working with this and teaching this. And I have developed with my higher self a set of tools for you that will allow you to have a 100% accurate higher self connection. Now, um, what I'd like to do to start with is to kind of give you uh, an idea about the higher self, what it is, and what I've come to know about this. And then we'll do some play, and I'll teach you some tools. And then in tomorrow's class, we'll get into some very powerful manifestation tools and go from there. OK, so we're going to begin with the 12 recognitions. Um, I was told by spirit to look at the 12-step program and um, you know, kind of get a thing from that. And I'm sure all of you know about the seven chakras. You've all heard those terms. But there's an additional five secret ray chakras. And so what I was told is that there would be a way to connect all of this together. So 12 is 5 plus 7. And we're going to get into this. Oh, this is so fun. I do not. <laughs> We're playing here as I learn how to use this piece of equipment. OK. Now what do I need to do to fix that? Tap it 
Well, I'd like, I'd like the R to be visible just in case people don't recognize the word. I'll recognize. <laughs> so what are we doing that's not quite right? I'll talk while she figures it out. While Noelle figures it out. OK, so what is the higher self? Let me do this. Let me get out of your way. What is the higher self? And click it again if you would. Just No, just one click. Where does it exist? And how can you develop a higher self connection? And then how to make a commitment and keep it. So the higher self is the part of you. I'm not going to be able to fix it if you're going to. Keep going? Yeah. So just keep going. At this okay. Point, All right. I'll give you, wait, wait. I'll give you like three minutes. Is that okay? Is that going to do so. it? Okay. If it isn't working, we'll, we'll make it, we'll just manage. The higher self is the version of you that is fully plugged in to God. It is the version of you that is the equivalent of what all the world's religions will teach you is heaven. So your, your body is perfect, you're plugged into God, your relationships are great. You know, think about all the things we've been taught about heaven from the traditional sense, and then think, to yourself, okay, that's all of that and more, the perfected self, that's 5D. Now, I'd like to give you a vocal demonstration of 5D because there was a reference in the last talk also about music, and I'd like you to get a greater understanding. I actually do have a handout for you at some point, not just yet, that will show you each of the dimensions, but I want to help you kind of get your arms about around fifth and then around third, where we are and why are we skipping over fourth and all of that. So we all remember the song from The Sound of Music, Do a deer, a female deer. Remember that? Yeah. Okay, and she's singing to teach the children the scale. Okay, this is called the diatonic scale and it was developed by Pythagoras officially became, becoming the scale of the new era of the Baroque period and then the Renaissance, of course. That became the primary scale, although there are older scales that are out there. But this scale represents the celestial bodies around the sun in their distance, and then it is balanced. So it isn't so that you can sing one note and sing the octave, and they are the same. And so I'll sing for you so you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, one. One, one. Can you hear the octave? OK. So then we have five, and we have three, and we have four. We're playing around three. We're playing around four. So I'm going to sing a little song for you. And then I want you to hear carefully what you're missing. And then we'll go from there. One, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one, three, four, four, four. Three, four, 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 five, five, one. Can you hear how when you hear three and then four, it's, it's, uh, it's not happy to stay there. It wants to go somewhere, okay? Fourth dimension is this place of, uh, it's the place that they talk about where you can only eat one Lay's potato chip, okay? You can't. You're, you're, you're mesmerized. It's the place of quicksand. It's the place that Rip Van Winkle went for 20 years. Or if you ever read the book Mists of Avalon or saw the movie, it's the place where Morgaine parted the mists and went into the ethers. Okay, so fourth has a high and a low, but it's, it has the quality of, of a high vibration of movement. And fifth dimension is this plane of the perfected human, the perfected self. Okay? So I want you to hear it again, and then we're going to go on. What? The, the next thing. Um, one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one, three, four, four, four. Everybody? Three. <laughs> and then we're going to go to five and one, the octave. You ready? 
four, 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 five, five, one. Okay, so when we go fifth dimensional, it's going to be a snap to go to the octave. And that's exactly what's going to happen with this planet and everybody on it. So that's what that means. Okay, now, where does it exist? It coexists where we are. And if you remember the movie Contact, where Jodie Foster like literally shifted dimensions right where she was, that's us. And right now, each of you have already been fifth dimensional at least once in your life. You would not be in this room, you would not be connected to dowsing and the grid work if you weren't already jumping into fifth. You just don't know it. And how do you know you, you've been in fifth or fourth? How many of you had something disappear? and then later have it show back up in the exact spot that you looked. Okay, so here's what happened to me. I'm doing all this higher self work and I start asking, where did my stuff go? You know, I had four kids. If something disappeared, it was the kids that took it, right? Where else would it be? But you know, if it was stuff you knew the kids didn't want, like your crystals or your book or something, you're, you're, you're kind of concerned. You know, the kids could get batteries and money and candy, but the rest of it they keep their hands off of. So. I started asking, where did my stuff go? And I would always be told it's in the fourth dimension. Well, as a mom, at, you know, at some point, you don't really care what they did or why they took it. You just want it back. You know, if you've got my kitchen scissors, I don't care. Just bring them back so I can fix dinner, you know? So <clears throat> one day when I was told for the umpteenth time that my missing stuff was in the fourth dimension, I said, okay, I want it back. Well, I was a little bit sassy when I said it, so I thought I'd better say thank you very much. And the next time I looked for it, it was right there. So one day, um, and I didn't tell anybody. You know, I was still wearing my blue suit to work. I, was, I had a, a big corporate job. You know, I was, I was somebody, and, and, you know, I was very well known. And, and uh, one day one of my sons came home, about 16 years old, one of the most grounded of the, of the four boys. And um, he, he threw something in his backpack and then threw it on the floor and then walked in the kitchen and started telling me some story. And then uh, he said, here, I'll show you what I mean. And he walks back into the living room, puts his hand in the backpack, and whatever the item was that he was going to show me, it's not there. Now, I was in my own home with my own son, and I kind of forgot myself. And for the first time, I said it out loud. I said, oh, honey, it's probably in the fourth dimension. We'll just ask for it to come back. Now, can you imagine what my 16-year-old thought? So, you know, what else is he going to do, right? So by this time, he's pulled everything out of the backpack. It is definitely not there. So I said, well, just put everything back the way it was and come in the kitchen and finish your story. So he did. He finishes his story and we walk back in the living room. And I said, okay, let's check for it. Right on top, right where he had left it. And that was the first time that I knew for sure I wasn't making it up. Because half the time, the information I was getting, I believed 100%. And the other half of the time, I thought, this is really weird stuff. So. <clears throat> Over time, I began telling people, if your stuff's missing, you just check in and ask. If it's in the fourth dimension, you can ask for it to come back. So then I um, was driving down the road one day, same son's driving my van. I'm in the front seat next to him, and my van starts making this weird noise. And I know enough about cars to be dangerous. I know you have to change the oil, and there's belts and stuff in there, but that's about it. And... As it's making this funny noise, I said out loud, what's going on with my car? And out of my mouth came the technical explanation. And as I heard myself say this, I burst out laughing because it was hilarious to hear that come from my mouth. And I began thinking about, well, what, what was that? How did I do that? And I realized there was only one question to ask your higher self, and we're going to get to that. So I'm going to stop my story and continue, to be continued, to kind of keep you on the edge of your seat here. Um, so uh, what is the higher self? Where, where does it exist? Okay, exist, it's nested within you. 
Um, we're going to learn how to do a higher self connection. And I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to keep the higher self connection. And what's stopping you? Only a belief system that those that would have us fail would like you to have. And I will tell you that everything on the planet, geomatic, ge, ge yeah, that one, GS, <laughs> um, chemtrails, harp, all of these energies that are being broadcast to dumb down the population are not affected by your Merkaba, if you have one in place. And when you have a higher self-connection, it cannot interfere with that. So this is the reason you want to develop this higher self-connection. It is another tool in your toolbox. OK, uh, so we'll talk about how to make that commitment. Oh, what do I want to do here? <coughs> we are we in the right format that I can advance? Let me try this. OK, here we go. All right, first of all, let's talk about the higher self and the lower self. How many of you have heard of the lower self? Anybody? OK, it comes from the Huna teaching. And um, <clears throat> when I first heard about it, I kind of blew it off because I already had a higher self connection. And I thought, well, you know, who needs that? That's kind of unimportant. And what I discovered, though, is that the lower self is pretty important. The lower self is what uh, directs you in terms of your moods, in terms of your emotions. It's your emotional body, your mental body, your physical body. It represents everything around you in terms of the earth. It's what gives you intuition. It's what impacts your pendulum and so on. And the lower self will give you good, accurate information. But it is limited in scope limited in scope. The higher self, oh, and by the way, the lower self can also give you a false positive. How many of you have had your pendulum give you an incorrect answer? You wouldn't be an honest dowser if you didn't say yes, because we've all had that happen. Higher self will not give you an inaccurate answer, because the higher self is your direct connection to God, and it cannot be interfered with, it cannot be toyed with, and it is your inheritance to have it. Um, now, I'm going to tell you a story to kind of bring home the message so you really understand what I'm talking about. This is a made-up story, and it's about go going down the road in a really nice car on a highway, on a um, mountain. And as you're going up this mountain with the top down, you are feeling really good, and maybe you're driving kind of fast, going around the curves, feeling exhilarated, and then all of a sudden you think, you know what, this could be dangerous, I better slow down. That's your lower self kicking in and reminding you, you know, take care of the body, be safe, blah, blah, blah. The higher self is sitting at the top of the mountain looking down. And it gives you a message that says, stop at the scenic overlook coming up. Now, you might not even have seen a sign. And you're thinking, an overlook? And then, then you come up on it. So in the meantime, there is a car coming down the mountain. And it goes left of center in front of you. Now, in the first scenario, the car has um, gone left of center in front of you, but you, because you slowed down and are paying attention, you're able to get out of the way. You don't go off the edge of the mountain. You might have your adrenaline going, but you're fine. Everything's cool. In the second version, when that crazy driver comes down the mountain going left of center, where are you on the scenic overlook? So the higher self is proactive and giving you information before you need it, before you know you need it. And it's plugged into everything you care about and everything that you are focused on. So now I'm going to tell you a true story. Um, I moved to New York about four years ago from Wisconsin. And so before that, when I was traveling to New York to give workshops, I would check in. And by the way, it, it, with my organization, every person who works for me, we all have to have this connection going and we all check in. So, you know, I have a wonderful um, uh, volunteer 
who does all of my workshop events. She sets them all up in various places all over the world. She's in Calgary. Her name's Diane Smith. And Diane will, and I will get on the phone and she'll check in and I'll check in to see, should we go to this city at this time and so on. So back then, I was checking in for uh, when I should return to New York because I had been in New York and I was thinking I should reserve my space because you have to reserve in advance to get a function space. And I got told I should return uh, in September. And then I asked which weekend and I was told the second weekend of September. And so I called the conference center and I booked the space. And then we started to get signups and we probably had close to 20 people and we had two workshops and back then I would not let people take an advanced class with me if they had not been practicing the Merkaba for several months. So we did the advanced class first to kind of put people off and get them to understand. If you want to get an advanced class, you have to do this one first. And so we did the advanced class first, and then the whole weekend was the um, Polar of Life Merkaba class. Now, when I went to buy the airline ticket mid-August, after I had a full boatload of people signed up, I could not bring myself to fly home on Tuesday like I had planned. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a vacation day because I really love New York. And I haven't taken a vacation day. Now, back then, I didn't think to ask my higher self about my vacation day. I asked about workshops. I asked about, you know, what to do with my programs. But it hadn't occurred to me that, that my vacation was subject to my higher self involvement. So... <clears throat> I was, I'd made plans, you know, to go see some museums and have dinner with some friends. And I had a free accommodation, so it was easy to do. But when I went, by the, went to buy the airline ticket, I felt such a strong message that I could not fly home on September 11th. So then I said, okay, so what am I supposed to do? And I was told, fly home immediately. Now that feeling you've all had, the feeling of to not do something, and I'll tell you what it's like. When you play the game of Monopoly and you pull the card that says, go straight to jail, do not collect $200, that feeling, it's the same feeling. So I booked my ticket to fly home Monday, September 10th, 2001. The workshops were a mile from ground zero. And where I was staying was a half a mile from ground zero. I would not have been on any of the planes that were grounded, but I would have been stuck in New York, which would have been a little bit uncomfortable because I had a workshop the next weekend in Atlanta. And plus, my youngest was still in high school, and so I wanted to be home when he came home from his father's. So <clears throat> the higher self stepped in and made it abundantly clear to me, even though I wasn't asking, should I fly on this day or that day because of, of the vacation day, I thought I should just come home after the vacation day. But my higher self came in in advance, proactively, giving me very clear direction. You're not flying on Tuesday. So you got to get home. First thing, I was on the very first flight Monday morning after those classes. That's the difference between the higher self and the lower self. The lower self is who you are as a person as you start to connect with your intuition and gives you good information. Now, you as dowsers are often using your dowsing instruments proactively. And that's you know, why you're here, to learn how to do that. But in terms of the lower self in general, it is only able to give you a read on what the status quo is. It is not able to give you a read on the situation normal changed. You know, there's a military phrase called snafu. And some of you may have heard what it means. Situation normal, all blank up. So... SNAFU stands for everything has changed. And I will say to you that what the higher self will do is help you be in a place where you can move through the reality as if you are a fifth dimensional being. And we are capable of it now. We're capable of it now because the veils have thinned. And it is even easier and easier to do this work. All right. Well, I don't know what I did, but I should stop doing it and do this. Here we go. Your higher self can guide you back home to God. 
And this is what we were talking about. The higher self will make sure you get what you really want, even when it doesn't make sense at the time. Now, I will tell you, as a mom, it was very, very helpful. One time I was driving home from work, and I'm working a full-time job with my four sons at home, and um, I get told to stop at the grocery store on the way home. And I live, you know, at the edge, edge of town and um, next to my, you know, across the way from my house are the farms. So uh, if I'm going to go to the grocery store, it should be on the way home. But I'm tired. I don't want to stop at the store. You know, I, I took, I have menus, I have groceries in the house, whatever. And my higher self tells me, stop at the grocery store. And I don't want to stop. So I say, I don't want to stop. Stop at the grocery store. Okay, fine. We're stopping. So once I get in the grocery store, I, I ask, well, so what am I here? Now, think about it. If your higher self is proactive, maybe your higher self is so that you can run into someone and you can talk to your friend. doesn't mean you have to buy groceries. So I walk in. What am I here for? Tuna fish. Tuna fish? Tuna fish. No, I, I don't need tuna fish. Are you having tuna fish casserole for dinner tonight? Yes, I am. Get tuna fish. Okay, fine. So I buy the tuna fish. Well, if you had four sons and a cat, you'd know why there was no tuna fish at my house when I thought there was. Now, it's not a big deal, but it's something that's very yummy that you have, you know, if you have a plan that you want to fix one thing, and if you can't have all the ingredients that you had already assembled a couple of days ago, you know, you kind of, you, you can't finish what you intended, so it's frustrating. And I'm sure I could have rustled up something, but it's the idea that, my higher self knew that that was important to me and told me. There were other times when my sons would not return home from uh, whatever they were doing by curfew. And I asked my higher self, are they okay? Yes. Will they be home on time? No. <laughs> is, it, is it appropriate for me to go ahead and go to sleep? You know, because I had to go to work. Yes. And so I'd leave a note on their pillow, you know, wake me when you get in. And what a relief, as a single mom, to know that your kids were okay, even though they weren't home when they ought to be. That's pretty amazing. And I don't know how I would have gotten through those years without that. So I want to talk a little bit about what it means to ask your higher self. Your higher self is not a parent. It's the same as you. Only it has full access to everything that you are part of without you knowing how it knows. So when you ask your higher self for permission, as it sometimes is used, it's not really like permission. i got to stop doing that. It's not like permission with uh, a parent. It's more like permission from the accountant. So... If you look, you see, I have a note here, the higher self is like the bookkeeper that says it's okay to write a check. The balance is enough to cover it. So when you call the bookkeeper or the accountant and you say, you know, I want to cover, I want to pay this balloon payment, do you um, ask permission from this person? No. But do they have the information you need to make a good decision? Yes. So when you work with the higher self, your higher self can give you information that you don't have. Now, there's one danger here, and that is that you might collect data so you can make a decision. And I recommend that you not do that. Instead, I recommend that you ask your higher self about the decision. So let's look at practical terms. If you are going, let's say you're not getting along with someone, and you get invited to a party, and you're worried that that person is going to be there, you might ask your higher self, you know, is so-and-so going to be there? Because if they're going to be there, I'm not going to go. I, I would say instead, ask your higher self, is it in my highest and best good to go to this party? I'm kind of tired. I'd go if it was important. And let your higher self tell you whether it's beneficial or not. Because your higher self knows stuff you don't know. Now, one of the best stories I can tell you about the difference between the higher self and the lower self is a story of, of connection between men and women. And in the years that I was dating, and um, meeting people, I met somebody that I really was attracted to, and he was really attracted to me. I could tell the way he was acting. And we had met at some party, and I was checking in to see, you know, if this guy asked me out, should I go out with him? And I got told yes. And so he did ask, and we did go on this date, and the only way to describe the date was to say it was flat. It wasn't good, it wasn't bad. 
So my time was so precious, is so precious, that I came in and I went right to the altar and I said, what was that all about? That was a big waste of my time because I knew I would never see this person again. And I was kind of annoyed that it was, you know, there was this, this yummy physical kind of connection, but, you know, there was nothing else happening. And um, my higher self said to me, you never asked. And I said, I most certainly did, blah, blah, blah. Oh, no. You asked, and your lower self answered. The lower self being the little girl in me that wanted to be special. The, the emotional and physical part of me that was wanting to be sexual and interactive in that way. And so those were validly saying, yeah, yeah, let's go for it. But at the end of the day, if I had asked my higher self, my higher self would have shown me, won't go anywhere, won't be worth your time, don't bother. Now, since I have made a commitment to my higher self to always follow my higher self, only once did I not follow my higher self. And I'll, say, I'll start out by saying, once you make this commitment to your higher self, to work with your higher self at this level, you, if you don't do it, you will be sorry. And it's kind of funny because uh, it wasn't anything super important, but I wanted to, I was traveling back to New York and I wanted to spend time with some friends who I cared for very deeply. And they said, well, you know, we're going to the movies. If you want to tag along, that's fine, but we already made this plan. And it was an art film. And I asked my higher self if I should go, and my higher self said no. But I thought, oh, what, you know, what's an art film? It's nothing. So I went ahead and went to this film with them, and the film was pretty bad. It was so bad that I wanted to walk out, and I've only walked out on like three or four films in my whole life. So, uh, but I didn't want to hurt my friend's feelings, so I stayed. And after the film was done, and we chatted for a minute before we went our ways, I said to them, you know, I, I didn't really care for this film. I thought it was pretty bad. And they said, well, we thought so, too. In fact, we wanted to leave. And I said, so did I. <laughs> and so it was a very good example, again, of the higher self knowing something you don't know. And to know that it wouldn't be worth my time. OK. That was supposed to be fixed. That word is supposed to be data. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Quick question. Yes. And yeah, how did that happen? And the answer is I asked and presumed it was my higher self talking. So one of the tools that you are, are going to be given right now is when you check in with your higher self, you always ask higher self. You always say in your thought, higher self. Because there can be an impersonator to the higher self if you don't specify. You know, if I say, hey, you, in pink, well, how many people are wearing pink? There's two women, three women right in the first two rows wearing pink. Well, who am I talking to? But if I say the person's name, we know exactly. So you always address your higher self by the word higher self. So in the case of the boyfriend routine, it was because I asked the question without saying higher self and presumed that the only voice I would hear was my higher self. Well, I've got news for you. There's lots of voices out there that can influence you. OK, now, I don't think we have time to talk about the blow of the heart. What's my time? Just a minute. It is 11.34. Do you have another 45 minutes? OK, all right. Well, we'll talk briefly about the blow to the heart. Can, can you tell me your question? I may ask you to hold it. Go ahead. I'm just wondering what we're acknowledging. Aren't we asked to know a higher self? You could be. But I will tell you, having used the pendulum, having worked with that first for many years, that what I have concluded is the pendulum can still be influenced by outside forces. But when you check in with your higher self, there's no external something to prevent your connection be, from being crystal clear. So, And this is also not to dismiss the work of dowsing because it is quite valuable but to say, here is another tool for your toolbox. And it is something that's very personal that you can use to help you achieve what you need to achieve. You could effectively go do work as a dowser without any dowsing instrument using your higher self. Entirely possible. OK, so we're going to talk briefly about this. I've got two slides on this, so I want to go fairly fast. A blow to the heart is 
pull this a little, away a little bit. You're popping a lot. There I know. I don't know how to stop that. I keep leaning into more distance. Okay. Um, a blow to the heart is uh, when someone you know who's close to you, so it could be your partner, your spouse, a sibling, an offspring, a close associate, does something that you know they know better. That's happened to practically everybody. But to understand it as a blow to the heart where you see layers of protection that we all put around our heart as we become adults, and someone comes in with that can get close to you because outsiders can't get close to you. You don't care what an outsider thinks, but when an insider says something and they come in with a blow to this layer, it shatters. And you have a choice to either keep your heart open more or to patch that up. Now, the people who patch it up are bitter. That's how you know what has happened to them. People who are keeping their heart open uh, recognize this, this experience as a blow to the heart and as rocket fuel for your ascension work. So the person does something. You know they know better. You might even confront them. And then you decide that it doesn't matter. You don't have to forgive them because you have to decide it doesn't matter. If you forgive them, you confirm your position as the victim. So just skip over all of that and go right for doesn't matter. I'm choosing to receive this blow to the heart. I've been wounded. Now, it's OK to wail and complain to a trusted friend. But I tell people three times and you're out. So you tell your story three times. Now, one time I can remember, I don't even remember what the issue was, but I was really upset and hurt about something that happened. And I remember thinking as the, when the phone rang and this person said to me, well, Maureen, how are you doing? And I, and I remember thinking, no, nah, I'm not going to tell her. I'll get a lot more mileage with my last one with my sister. So I just said, well, I'm fine, you know, and then when I got my sister, I got, I got all I could get out of it. <laughs> so it's okay to do that because it's very important that you understand that what you resist persists. So when you push and tell your story and validate your victimhood, you are then telling the universe, that's who I am. I've changed what I was, but this is who I am now. But if you wail and complain and you limit it to, I say, three times, what it does is it allows the emotions to move through you so there's no resistance, there's no blockage, and then you can move on and keep your heart open. That means you don't forgive the person because there's no forgiveness required. Instead, you decide to thank them <coughs> because they helped you open your heart. I'm not going to bother giving any examples because I figure you know this one and I need to keep going. Working with your higher self, you, you start to remember that you are the co-creator of your reality. That means you take responsibility where you're at, you give up the blame game, you pay attention to your thoughts and words, and you choose new expressions for old one. Instead of a something moment after 60, you might say, I am having a multi-dimensional moment. <laughs> and you are. Because if you've left awareness here and you're out here somewhere, where else have you gone but multi-dimensional? So scratch that from your vocab. Now, one of the things I learned is that, you remember when in the work of Perhaps you don't know this work, but you know I, ca I came through this thread of, of people who are studying the early work that's kind of been labeled New Age or metaphysical. And there is a very well-known author named Louise Hay who has taught a lot about how you speak and how you look at things. And she made a point of teaching us that what we say matters. And instead of saying this food is to blank for, you might say this food is to live for. You'll notice I won't even say the word because I have found that just in my lecture circuit, when I would uh, say these things in a presentation, it would accidentally creep into my everyday language when I wasn't paying attention. So <clears throat> I want you to notice how you use your words. Now, 
I don't know that we're going to have time today, but I'd like to give you an example. At 3D, when we want to have privacy and we want to recognize that someone doesn't need to know every little detail about herself, and we're trying to get that conveyed, you might have the thought or words in your mouth that are saying something like, well, it's none of your business. At 5D, it would be more like, well, she doesn't have the password. Because when you say it's none of your business, it's a, it has this pejorative, you know, diminishing quality, takeaway quality. But when you say a person doesn't have a password, well, lots of people don't have the right password. You know, you might know my bank name or, and my name, but you don't know my passwords. And so there's no, it doesn't have that quality of a put down. And every time you use a word that is polarity based, you can find a new way to describe it that moves it out of the polarity realm, which is 3D based, into 5D, which is not polarity based, by your words. So um, I'm trying to think of another example. I had one in my head as I was talking. Uh, the idea of hot and cold, or good and bad, or high and low. When one of my boys, one of my um, sons was about three years old, we had him tested because he was so smart. And they took him in another room and they were giving him this test at three. And they said, so if, they'd you know, gone through this hot and cold and stuff like that. And so they said, um, lemons are sour and sugar is, and he said, bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in the next room overhearing this, and I thought, wow, I had no idea what an impression I was making. So instead of good and bad, perhaps we would use the term, this feels appropriate for me. Instead of, I want to make the right choice, instead say, I want to make a choice that pleases me now but leaves room for growth. I am choosing for the optimal opportunity. Instead of, so start to use different words for right and wrong. Because when you use the word right, you are implying the existence of wrong. Do you see? And at 5D, there is no polarity. Now, we are in a transition zone, and I will tell you that in 19, excuse me, in 2002, I was walking through the Paris subway, and I saw an incredible mural of Archangel Michael with his sword, and he was like spinning. And if you've ever been in Paris, in the Paris subway, and you've seen it, it is quite remarkable. It's as vibrant as could be. And as I'm contemplating some very um, deep, emotionally um, tragic things, I get told that we only need a homeopathic dose of darkness, told the balance of the light. Wow. Wow. So don't let anybody tell you that if there's more light in the world, now there's going to be more darkness, because it's not so. And I will also tell you that there are statistics out there that that are not well known, but that I have it from the work of the grid working that I'm doing, that the incidence of crime of all kinds have reduced in the Western world. I don't know if there are statistics in the undeveloped countries, but in the US and Canada right now, there has been a huge decrease of all kinds of crime. I'm not so sure about white collar crime. I'm hearing a little voice in my head, don't forget, you know, that stuff, but we're, we're going to go, that's coming up to light so that it will be stopped. <clears throat> now, this is the next piece. Recognize that the way you receive is not related to the giver. Some, if someone insults you, don't hear it. You cannot be insulted when you only hear compliments. So, did you know that you cannot insult a blonde? Because, why can't you? because she only hears compliments. So when you say, oh, you're 
you're ice cold. And you can say, yes, I'm very good at keeping my cool. And when someone calls you the ice queen, you can say, oh, she knows I was a queen in a past life. That's so cool. <laughs> One time, my stepfather, who had a way with words, uh, was frustrated with me about something that I did not understand what he was trying to do. He was trying to be nice to me, but that wasn't his usual pattern, so I didn't recognize it right away. And so I, um, I was kind of resisting what he was doing, but not to be, to, I was trying to be respectful of him. And, it, it, you know, in frustration, he said, oh, you're just like your mother. And I remember turning to him with great happiness and a big smile, and I said, you know what? I am so grateful. That is the nicest thing you have ever said to me. <laughs> and he started to say, that's not, and he stopped <laughs> mid-sentence. So he had changed the reality, and I had changed the reality. And then my mother, who was sitting in the front seat, kind of leaned over to me and said, I don't think that's, and I said, uh, I patted my mom, and I said, I know, but I get to choose how I receive it, and so do you. <clears throat> and so you decide you are loved. You decide. Now, there's a lot of ways to clear out this unfinished business of not being loved, and, you know, that's what my company is about. I mean, we have tons of tools, meditation CDs, my books, the oils. They're just remarkable. If you haven't had a chance to try them, please do. Even if I'm not there, my only request is that when you use them, the oils, I'm going to use my water as the example, you, you wouldn't open a bottle. There's a whole kit out there that's already open. So you just, you know, kind of check in, use your dowsing tool if you want, and pick out one that you're supposed to use right now, and hold your hand out, and then let the bottle drip it. Don't be touching it because you're going to mix your oils with mine. It's a sample kit. It won't matter if you do touch, but it's preferable that you don't. And then you... Um, have the oil in your hand, and then you put your other hand on top of it and warm it by rubbing your hands together, and then put yourself in prayer position and bring it up to your face, and then open and inhale, and exhale. Inhale, exhale. Three times. And then let that shift you, and you will be amazed. And then there's, there's charts there that explain all the oils right now are doing two things. They're doing repair work, and they're also doing... Um, rebuild work. And the repair work is subtle. So you don't know that you're having anger cleared out or fear or shame, but it's, it's leaving you. And those kinds of self things that you're holding in you keep you from being loving to everyone else and loving to yourself. So it's a very set, wonderful set of tools. And I would love it if I didn't have to take any of this stuff back because when I ship to Canada, you guys get hit with uh, you know, duty or something. And so if you, if you think you like this stuff and you want to buy, please do because you'll save shipping and duty. Um, okay. What's the prime directive? I believe the prime directive is to separate from that which is inseparable. If we come out of God, we're already everything. But if we separate from that which is inseparable, pretending that we're not connected to God, and then little by little uncover our godly connection, then we've expanded the database more than it would have been. <coughs> Say it again. I don't quite understand what you mean. You should separate? We have already separated. In other words, if you're already union with God as a soul, and then you come out of that to move into 3D creation, into the reality, you've separated from God and you've put the veil on. So you have separated from that which is inseparable to expand the database. Uh, so the obvious is you can use your higher self to uh, optimize that journey. How cool is that? You know, as a mom with four kids, I can tell you I was into efficiency. I had it all down. Somebody said to me, how do you manage with, you know, with four? And I said, well, it's, what's really interesting is you don't have to discipline all four. You discipline one and they all line up, you know? You tell one person, 
use your napkin. And they all pull their napkin out. Um, it's quite interesting to watch. Now, this is another dichotomy. We recognize that we're, you at the, are at the center of your own universe, and we have shared realities. We all share that which we've decided to co-create together. And, but at any time, you can opt out. You know, I used to, when I, when I lived in my house in Wisconsin, there was this little kid that would come once a week and put this newspaper on my front stoop. It was a free newspaper. And if you weren't looking for a car or a date, it was worthless. So, you know, who needs this? Now, you don't, I never ran after this little kid and say, stop doing that. I would just pick it up and throw it in the garbage. But if you didn't want to get that paper, you could call the company and opt out. Everybody comes in with mass consciousness programming. And we're plugged into mass consciousness until we unplug. Now, I don't recommend that you unplug from everything because then you'd be a mess. But what I would say is there are specific things that you do want to unplug from. And when you, when you notice something, you pull out of that. Now, there are three things that I have been shown that cause us to be spoon-fed the mass consciousness stuff that we probably don't want. Coffee, the morning coffee ritual, not just coffee, but the morning coffee ritual. News. Newspapers, or the news, exactly, or, the, you know, like CNN. And TV in general. So when you turn on your TV or when you tap into that ritual of the morning, I got to have my morning coffee, you have opted in and you're going to get all that stuff you didn't think you were asking for. So if you don't want to opt in, change your coffee routine. If you have to have coffee, then, you know, have a cup of tea first, have a drink of water or juice, do something different than the have to have at morning coffee before I can function and get out of that habit. And I'm not saying coffee is wrong or bad. I have a cup of coffee every once in a while myself. I personally don't tolerate coffee well, but <clears throat> I will have a cup of coffee once in a while because I like the taste of it. But I generally have it after lunch because I have been shown that this is one of the ways that those that would have you fail have found that they can just slide it in underneath like a subliminal. All right. Now we're going to talk briefly about fear. We're going to get into this in more detail on um, the class tomorrow. Fear is a messenger. Not too many people realize this. Um, but because I have developed the ability to interact with the elemental kingdom and the energy fields, I had an experience with fear and I started asking questions. And I was shown that fear is a messenger. Fear is a messenger from your consciousness sending out a red alert. And it is telling you that you are either out of integrity with your actions and your words. So you have to either change your belief or change your behavior. And when you think about what you might be afraid of, it's all rooted in that. Changing your, we're not talking about survival fear. We're talking about, you know, um, I actually had this happen, and we're going to talk about it more on, how's my time? 20 minutes. Okay. So I'm almost done with this. We're going to get into more detail on the fear part uh, tomorrow. But you can take that. Recognize that you have an obligation to operate in integrity. You always follow through once you ask your higher self. If you ask, you have to follow through. If you have some lovely bonbons in front of you and you really want to eat one, go for it. Don't be asking your higher self. Just eat one. Because you're going to eat one anyway, and then if you're, if you're not in balance with your higher self, you've kind of messed with the program. If you don't want to quit smoking, don't ask your higher self about it. Always ask the final question instead of seeking information so you can make a decision. We talked about that. Always ask this way, higher self. I think this is it. Okay, I think this is the last one. The only question, remember I said I would come back to this? There's only one question to ask your higher self when something happens that doesn't make sense. And that is, 
what's going on. Now remember the story about the car, the van, where it was making a funny noise? What I got out of that was that the, the one question, what, is completely open-ended. These other questions, who, what, where, when, why, or how, always give you information so you can act. But what gives you the full story? So go back to that idea when I said, what's going on when my stuff disappeared? Remember that? My higher self, I always said, where did my stuff go? I never said, what's going on? Where did my stuff go? And the answer was always the fourth dimension. And after I had this experience and I meditated on it and I kept asking, you know, tell me how I happened to be able to do that. I was shown that there was only one question to ask your higher self when anything happens that defies explanation. And that is, what's going on? What's going on? Now, when I, fast forward, one day after I'd been telling everyone there's only one question to ask your higher self, and something disappeared, instead of my usual, let's start to pass these out, my, instead of my usual uh, higher self um, question of where did my stuff go, I said, what's going on about something that was missing? And my higher self said to me, Maureen, you were in the fourth dimension when you put it down. And if I'm doing that, so are you. So think about those times that stuff reappeared after you kind of detached from finding it exactly where you knew it was supposed to be. And you had looked and torn everything out of that drawer and then you come back means you were in the fourth dimension when you put it down. It also means that the dimensions are sliding together between the, each other so cleverly that you and I aren't noticing when we're going fourth dimensional. Okay, now, we are passing around a toy. Everyone should have... What? We need the connectors? Yes, everyone needs a long one and a short one. Some of the long ones already have a connector on them. These make a little bracelet, but you're not going to use it for a bracelet. Once you tip it, it's going to um, light up. So you, we can turn the lights down a little, and it's going to be this cute little toy, but we're going to do something very significant with it. This kind of looks like one of those flattened circles, doesn't it, that um, Patrick was talking about? Okay, now I'm going to teach you a technique to think with your whole brain, and then we're going to, with the lights down, we're going to then do a little meditation where I'm going to help you connect with your higher self and give you that higher self connection. So I want you to use this to focus on something. You could use it to focus on me um, or maybe the screen. I don't care. But you have to have something in front of you that you're going to look at. So I'm going to pick this lovely lady in yellow. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at her with one eye closed and one eye open and get her right in the center. Then I'm going to look at her with my left eye um, closed and my right eye open, and she's no longer in the center, so I'm going to move it back. And now she's really off, so I'm going to keep doing it till they're both visible with each eye closed. Then open both eyes while you look through it, and you will see the vesica piscis. Now, a lot of people use the word Pisces, but Pisces is plural, and the true name of this shape that appears between two circles, the almond shape, the mandalora in art, is the vesica piscis, singular, one. So go ahead, I'll hold still, and look out of your um, circle, like you're looking out a magic circle, and wait till you get the person you're looking at in the center. They'll actually be on one side of the circle or the other, but you want them you want to be able to get both of them in the circle and then open your eyes at both of them and you will see the vesica. So everybody take a minute and do that. And this is you seeing with your whole brain. Okay. We don't have our rings yet. Okay. Well, it, 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 it doesn't have to light up. But if you want one that lights up here. 
You get one too. Up, 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 up. I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. Yes, I'm the guilty party. <laughs> I wanted to get to that gentleman back there. He needed it. All right. So I'll repeat the directions if you want to listen. I want you to look at me with one eye closed. Okay? And put me in the center. And then close the eye you've got open and open your other eye. So it's one eye and then the other eye only. One eye at a time. And then keep adjusting where you hold the circle till my face is on the is visible in both circles. I won't be exactly in the middle. I'll be close to the edge. But you'll be able to see with one eye that I'm in the center on one side. And with the other eye, I'm in the center. OK, does everybody see that? Yeah. All right, then, then once you've got that position, then open both eyes. And you should be able to see the vesica. The vesica is, one, is the most powerful creative tool on the planet. And when the sacred geometers make a big deal over it, there's a reason. And I'm going to teach you more about that tomorrow in tomorrow's class. So now I'd like to um, make a clear intention as you look this way that you connect with your own wisdom and your own higher self. So go ahead and put your circles down. You get to keep them. And I want you to close your eyes. And we're going to do a quiet meditation. We are asking all the beings of light that we work with, whether it's the angels, the descended masters, saints, devas, elemental kingdom, whomever you work with, And I want you to ask them to step in and help you. And I want you to remember a time when you've held a beloved being in your arms. If it's a horse, you have your arms around the horse's neck. If it's a pet, a cat or a dog, you might have this being on your lap or close to you. And I want you to hear yourself tell this being, I love you. Even if it's not your pet, but it's a pet that you know of, that you have perhaps been close to, allow yourself to feel deep love for this pet. Now you'll notice that your feeling in your body, especially around your heart and your chest, is slightly changed. Now, with that feeling of an open heart, I want you to now ask for your higher self to come in a little closer. So in your thought, you might say something like, I'm asking my higher self to come in a little closer. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to learn the language of the higher self. So repeat that in your heart. I'd like my higher self to teach me what that language is. And so like in every language, the first words you learn are how to say yes and no. We're going to now ask the question, higher self, show me my symbol or signal for yes. What does yes look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? Some people actually see colors. Some people hear the word yes. Some people have a feeling 
in their body. Make a note of what your symbol for yes is. Higher self, show me my symbol or signal for no. What does no look like, feel like, smell like, sound like? And higher self, give me my symbol or signal for neutral. What does neutral look like or feel like, smell like or sound like? Now, ask your higher self to show you how much you are loved. Now give thanks for this new information. <coughs> and open your eyes when you are ready. And we can turn up the lights a little. So uh, because you're dowsers, you probably have a very good connection to this concept. I would like to know, is there who here did not get any kind of a symbol or signal? OK, a few of you. All right. For those of you who did not get any kind of symbol or signal, I would like to invite you to do a separate exercise where you entrain yourself. Now the way that's done is like this. When one of my sons was about 18 or 19 months old, old enough to walk around and maybe uh, let me know he was hungry without necessarily being able to do anything about it, couldn't talk, but he learned to say the word ga. And every time I gave him cheese, he'd say ga. So it didn't take long for me to figure out that ga and cheese were the same. So if he'd come to me and say ga, mama, ga, I would get up and get him cheese. He's an adult now, and he knows how to say cheese. But he taught me his word for cheese. So those of you who did not get a symbol or signal, you will take an idea of something that you can replicate in your mind. Those of us who are very feeling uh, don't always get pictures or, or sensations. So you're going to intend that all of your right side of your body is alive and vibrating. And the way you do that is to build from your right hand, arm, elbow, wrist. And you work your way up, then the torso, then the right leg. And while your eyes are closed, you really focus on that. And then you show you this to your higher self. And you say, higher self, this is my symbol for yes. And then you do the same with your left side. And then you make the central energy within your top of your head to your feet for neutral. And what happens is then you will say, OK, higher self, show me yes. And this part of your body will feel more alive, and so on. That is a shortcut for those of you who had did not receive any kind of visual, did not get a feeling in the body, did not hear the word. How many people heard the word yes? Some people actually hear the word yes. 
Um, you know, what, how convenient. <laughs> Your higher self speaks human. Um, <clears throat> all right, so now, uh, let's see, where are we? So that is the technique. Now, that's step one. Step two is, this you might want to write down. There are seven pieces to this. Let's see if I've got it memorized. Um, you always, you do this practice for six weeks. So 45 days from today. What's today's date? Oh, it's easy. 45 days would be 15th of June. Okay? So from now until the 15th of June, you're going to do the following things. And you get to make a commitment. I would definitely ask you, and if you show up tomorrow, maybe we'll take time for that. But, you know, in your prayer work, when, whenever you do your prayer work, just make a little promise to your higher self. I'm going to do this practice for 45 days from now until June 15th, and I'm asking my higher self to help me stick with it. Okay? So number one, 45 days. Number two, you may only ask yes, no questions during the practice period. Number three, you may only ask unimportant questions. Yeah. Okay? That means if, if you're a person that always wears this jewelry with this jacket, you're not supposed to ask your higher self. You know, one time I was in a class and I'd explained this and people were practicing and then they came back for an advanced class and the woman walked in and she looked kind of funny. You know, she had a strange combination of, of attire and, you know, somebody was looking at her kind of funny and she said, don't ask, my higher self dressed me this morning. <laughs> so, you know, if you care about it, don't be asking your higher self because it suddenly has become important. Okay, now, here's why this works. <clears throat> Imagine for a moment that you have some kind of a therapy practice and you are working with an assistant who takes care of all the appointments and everything you could think of. And all you have to do is see the clients. One day you walk in and you say to her, you know, I'm going to start making the appointments and I'm going to buy the linens and I'm going to buy the oils. And you know, I've been thinking about this and I'd like to do all the billing too. And um, we'll just, you know, I'll just do those things. What do you think she's going to say to you? Who's going to do the main work? Exactly. Who's, it, it, she might even laugh at you and say, yeah, right, like you're going to do that and, and the thing you do. And that, you know, just, or, or what am I? <laughs> what, you know, what am I going to do? You know, am I being fired? That's you and your ego. Your ego got you in this room. Your ego is taking care of you. Your ego is your friend. And particularly in the West, the ego is like the jack-in-the-box. It is never going to go back in. So my recommendation is that you let the ego see how accurate your higher self is on all these practice questions about stuff you don't care about. Okay? Now let's go back to the scenario with the uh, helper or the assistant. If you say to that helper, well, I'm going to empty the garbage, she'll say, get the one under my desk first. If you say, I'm going to start washing all the windows, she's going to say, get the ones in reception. They always get a mess. And, you know, may as well do the toilet while you're at it. Because those are jobs she doesn't really care about. This is why you pick stuff your ego doesn't care about. And over time, your ego can see how accurate your higher self is. Now, let's just pretend that I always go to the races with 100 bucks, and I always come home from the races with $5,000. Would you like to go with me? And what are you going to do after I get done in line? I, I'm betting what Maureen's betting, right? Well, that's what's going to happen with your ego. Your ego is going to figure out that your higher self has got the winning bet all the time. And you don't, want to, you don't want to push that on your ego. You want your ego to discover it. And then the ego and the higher self get married. And they become one will, God's will. Isn't that amazing? There's more to the rules. As I explained earlier, you don't want to be asking questions about stuff that you're going to collect data so you can make a decision. Instead, you ask about the decision. That kind of takes practice to be aware of what you're really asking. And here's the hard part. For the next 45 days, if you do this, you have to put away all your other divination tools. Now. I teach this all over the world, and I have had people come to me from all over the world to thank me for teaching them. 
And I will make one caveat. If you do this work for a living and you use your pendulum, like Patrick, then you use your pendulum in your work. But then when you go home and you're on your own, on your own time, then you put it away. And you do this work for yourself without the use of the pendulum. Asking your higher self. And so you complete the six weeks practice. You have, you know, one part of your life where you're using the pendulum because that's your job. But everywhere else, you set it aside. Now, if I said to you, if you will give me six weeks, I will give you 100% accuracy for the rest of your life, would you choose it? Yeah. It's your decision. I hope, how are we doing time wise? Are we done? Um, yeah. Okay. So I hope. I know. There, there's a list, and what I'll do is I'll print up the list, and I'll leave it for everyone. You can just grab a piece of paper, and I'll give you the printed rules. I think it'd be easier for you. There's no, it's not in that handout. You know, I, now we know why I couldn't give you the handouts, because we're not using those here at this time. We're going to use them maybe later. It's very interesting. I was shown about this one handout, and, and I actually wrote an email to you, and I thought, well, there's others. I can't send this one to her. So I actually have a draft in my... I know where the handout is, but it's not there. <laughs> so we have to make out another handout for you. But I'll, I'll have it made right away. And we'll have it on the table. You just help yourself. Um, <clears throat> so the rules will come. So it is my deep pleasure to play with you and to get to know you and to be part of your life. And I invite you to come tomorrow. And I know it's going to be a tough decision, so maybe you better use your pendulum. Because <laughs> if you're making, remember, remember, if you're making the decision and it's important to you and you're going to make the commitment, you want to get in the practice of not using important decisions. See, here's what happens when you, just as a, a quick ending, here's what happens when you use your higher self-connection for important decisions before you have 100% accuracy. What happens is you self-correct. Like, you know, I asked my higher self about those bonbons. You know, they look really good. And then I just take one after my higher self has told me no. And I think, well, you know, it wasn't that clear. You know, I couldn't really tell whether that was my true sign. You know what I mean? You start to second guess yourself. So this is why if it's really important to you, use your pendulum right now. And if it's not important, you really don't care whether you go to, uh, is, what's the other guy's name? The... Neil, if you want to go to Neil's and you want to go to mine and you really can't decide, and I actually looked at the program and thought, boy, it's a good thing I'm presenting because I would have a terrible time deciding which workshop I want to go to. So if you, you know, if you really don't care and you want to go to both, then ask your higher self. But if you do care, don't ask your higher self. Begin that practice, and you'll see. Thank you very much.